Good morning and welcome to our morning service here at Ebenezer Evangelical Church in Neath Abbey. It's Sunday May the 23rd and this morning we're continuing our series in Matthew's Gospel as we continue to work our way through that Gospel. Isn't it great that we can come together to worship our God? So as we do that let me begin with prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you that we can come together this morning to worship you. Lord, as we come, we pray that you would help us to have our hearts and our minds fixed upon you. Lord, we pray for your blessing, we pray for your help, we pray for your strength, we pray for your guiding. And we ask, Lord, that you would um, be with us now. Help us to understand more about you, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin, just one or two notices for this week. Uh, this evening, uh, our service will be uh, just available online again. Uh, that's available through Facebook and YouTube. Um, if you don't already like our Facebook page, then uh, let me encourage you to do that. Uh, or, or our YouTube channel as well, you can subscribe to that. Um, but do please look for our evening service there this evening. That's uh, available from 5.30 and that'll be there. And then on Tuesday this week we have our usual prayer meeting, that's at 7.30 on Zoom. Uh, and on Wednesday there'll be a ladies prayer meeting, again 7.30, again on Zoom. Um, if, as ever, if you would like more information about any of our meetings, uh, the links and how to join, please do get in touch and we can get that information to you. Uh, then on Friday this week our young people uh, meet again, that's... Uh, on Zoom as well, 7 o'clock on Friday evening um, and then next Sunday we'll be back in the church building on Sunday morning um, and back online Sunday evening. Um, if you do, if you would like to join with us uh, in our morning services in the church building then please do get in touch, uh, then we can um, be sure to book you a seat. Uh, we obviously do have to continue to um, limit the number of people who can come because of spacing and uh, the rules and the regulations we have to keep but if you'd like to be there please do get in touch we can uh, be sure to squeeze you in so we turn again to Matthew's gospel this morning our reading for this morning is Matthew chapter 12 uh, verses 22 to 50 um, Matthew chapter 12 verses 22 to 50 uh, we pick up the narrative um, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ um, again. But Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. Then a demon-oppressed man was blind and mute, and was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the people spoke and saw. Sorry, let me begin that again. <laughs> Then a demon-oppressed man, who was blind and mute, was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed, and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? This then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not scatter, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. 
You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We pray that the Lord would add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Let's turn together to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank and praise you that we can come together into your presence this morning. We thank and praise you that we can come before you at all. Lord, we thank you for the great privilege that we have of prayer. The great privilege that we have of being able to come to our Almighty Father, to the Creator, the Sustainer of all things, and to bring to you our praise and our worship, to bring to you our requests and our petitions. Father, we know from your word that you you call us to pray at all times, in all situations, with all kinds of prayer. And yet, Lord, we, we confess that so often we do not take advantage of the privilege that we have of being able to pray to you. We don't take advantage of the, the opportunities that we have of being able to come to you. So, Father, first and foremost, we ask for your forgiveness for that. We ask for your forgiveness for our prayerlessness, for our wanting to go our own way and do things on our own and not come to you and seek your help and your strength and your leading. Father, we do thank you that it's because of our Lord Jesus Christ and it's through him that we can come to you at all. We thank you for his saving death on the cross. We thank you that it... Even as he was there on the cross dying, the, the way to the most holy place, the, the curtain in the temple was torn in two and the way to the most holy place, to the presence of God was opened up for us. So we no longer need a priest to come to you in prayer. We can each come on our own, in our own way, in our own place to you in prayer. And Father, how we thank you for that. But Lord, we ask that you would make us much more people of prayer. Give us that much greater desire to worship you in prayer, to seek you in prayer, to know you in prayer, to commune with you in prayer. Gracious God, help us in this, we pray. And Father, we pray that as we seek to know you more, that we would then seek to proclaim you more, to tell others more about you, to have Uh, your word preached, your name glorified. And so, Father, we pray for uh, the area of Neath Abbey around the church. 
We pray for the town of Neath, Lord. We pray that you would be working in this place. And Lord, as your word goes out week by week, we pray that there will be those who hear it, those who uh, come to understand what you have to say, what our Lord Jesus came to do, and put their faith and trust in him. Oh Lord, we long to see men and women saved, saved from sin, saved from death, saved from hell, saved for an eternal, glorious kingdom with you. But Father, we thank you too that we can come to you with our requests and Lord, we come and we plead with you for our world. We plead with you for the area of Israel and Palestine where this conflict goes on. Lord, we pray that you might bring peace. We pray that you might bring harmony. We pray that you might bring the gospel. We pray for those who are uh, working there to proclaim your word. We pray for those who are working there to help the sick the poor, the bereaved, the needy. We pray too for uh, nations like India where we see um, coronavirus still such a threat and such a, such a problem. Lord, we pray too for our own land where <clears throat> this uh, variant is, is spreading again. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we see the numbers in some parts of the country going up again, Lord. Um, Father, we pray that you would grant wisdom to our leaders, help them to make wise decisions as they seek to plan how we can combat this, how, how this can be dealt with, how this can be addressed, while all the time wanting to try and get back to some sort of normality. Father, we do pray for wisdom. We pray for your hand to be upon this whole situation. We thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in charge of all things. And so, Lord, we commit our nation, our situation to you. But, Lord, even now we pray that this spreading disease would cause people to seek you, to turn to you, to look for a better way, to know that that better way is found only in our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray for your help in that. We pray for your help now as we consider your word together. Father, bless your word to us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We turn back again then to that passage in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 12. Verses 22 to 50. Now there's an awful lot in this passage and I have to say at the beginning that we won't deal with every line, we won't deal with every thought that's there. We will just look at a uh, fairly high level uh, as we work our way through this passage. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I enjoy a good game of football. <laughs> it's been a long time since i played, uh, but I enjoy to watch a, a good game of football. And just last Saturday, uh, I really enjoyed watching the FA Cup final, the match between Chelsea and Leicester. And I enjoyed it particularly because I was a neutral. I, I didn't have any particularly strong feelings about who I wanted to win, whether it was Chelsea or whether it was Leicester. Uh, yes, I, I had a, a slight favourite, but at the end of the day, it wouldn't have mattered to me who won. I just wanted to see a good game of football. Because I was in neutral. It wasn't a particular concern to me who won, who lost. But the message that we have from our passage today, this passage in Matthew's Gospel, is that in the spiritual life, in the Christian life, there is no such thing as neutral. You can't be neutral when it comes to Jesus Christ. Uh, we've seen it over recent weeks, we've seen it in Matthew's Gospel, we've seen it in 1 Peter. The Gospel message divides people. The Gospel message divides people. Uh, and we're going to see that worked out as we work our way through this passage this morning. Um, we've got a number of headings, there's, there's nothing clever about the headings this morning. Uh, but the first of our headings this morning, covering uh, verse 22 through to 37, is just two kingdoms. Two kingdoms, two sides. And so we continue through 
the, this gospel message, we continue with the narrative about the deeds of the Christ. You remember a few weeks ago we heard of John the Baptist and how he heard of the deeds of the Christ when he was in prison. Uh, so we're kind of looking at those things, those amazing uh, miracles that Jesus did among the people. Now, as we thought last week, as we, as we concluded last week, Jesus withdrew from the Pharisees. He didn't withdraw from the people, but he, he withdrew. He backed away from the Pharisees. But it seems that they kept on coming after him. So today we see another, another healing by the Lord Jesus Christ. We see a man. Uh, at the beginning we have this demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute. Now it seems that the demon um, that was, that was uh, oppressing him caused him to be blind. So he wasn't able to see. He was mute, so he couldn't speak. He was in a really bad way. Now there's no indication from Matthew here whether this is a, a continuation of the idea of Jesus healing on the Sabbath or whether this is uh, just another day of the week. Um, but what we do see is that there certainly seems to be no hesitation from the Lord Jesus when it comes to healing. Uh, we thought uh, just in the previous passage of how many followed him and he healed them all. And here another man uh, was brought to him and he healed him. He healed him. Matthew gives us no detail. We don't have the how or the, or the where. Simply that Jesus healed the man. He healed him so that the man could speak, and so that he could see. His blindness was taken away, his, his muteness was taken away uh, immediately by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what Matthew does go on to, to show us very clearly is the response to that. We, we've seen, haven't we, in recent weeks, there are two responses to the Gospel. There's belief and there's rejection. So it is here, as the man is healed, there are two very different responses. The first, uh, from the people. All the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? And so the people, they, 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 they showed amazement. And they began to question among themselves, can this be the son of David? Can this be the Christ? Can this be the one who was prophesied, the one who was to come? Well, we've seen in recent weeks, the answer to that is very much yes. He is the Christ. He is the one who was promised. He is the one who was to come. He is the one who would save his people from their sins. But among the Pharisees, now remember the Pharisees were already plotting how they could kill Jesus, how they could destroy him. And among the Pharisees, it causes outrage. And when they heard it, they said, verse 24, It's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. In other words, Jesus this man, he can only cast out demons but by the power of Satan. It's the power of Satan at work in him that causes him to be able to cast out demons. And so by, by their words, we have this idea of these two kingdoms. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, uh, or the kingdom of the prince of demons. And so the challenge is put, uh, in a way, to the Pharisees, to, to Matthew's readers and to us. Who will you follow? Who will you follow? Which kingdom are you seeking to be a part of? Who's your king? Is it the king of kings? King Jesus, the one who rules over all? Or is it Satan, the prince of demons? The prince of this world? Do you want to be a part of the kingdom of light? Or the kingdom of darkness? Because... Put bluntly, that is the choice that there is here. Do you want to follow King Jesus or do you want to follow Satan, the prince of demons? Where do you stand? Now the Pharisees accuse Jesus by saying that he can only cast out demons by the power of Satan. By, by, that was the only way he could heal the man was by the power of Satan. But Jesus responds to them. It is basically this. Think about it. How can that be the case? If Satan is defeating Satan, then he's already lost. If a kingdom is divided against itself, how can it stand? If an army fights against itself, if a city fights against itself, it's already lost. You know, just think of any of those those battles in 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 the world wars that we're so familiar with. If 
any one side had turned on itself and began to fight itself, the war would be over. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. There are two kingdoms at war. And there will only be one winner. One outcome. Now, the war is already decided. The Lord Jesus Christ has already won. But there are still battles going on. We see that in verse 28 here. As Jesus tells the Pharisees that they really need to think about what it is that they're claiming. Uh, after all, as Jesus says, if it is by the power of of the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. His identity as the Messiah is being revealed, but the Pharisees refuse to accept the evidence. The people are asking, is this the Christ? Is this the Son of David? But the Pharisees are saying, no, 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 he's, he's, he's working for Satan. He he's, gets his power from Satan, not from God. But Jesus reiterates to them, the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God has come, and the Pharisees are on the wrong side of the battle lines. And so Jesus wants them to think about what it is that they're claiming. When he asks questions, it's to, to teach, to get them to think. But Jesus goes on, verse 29, or how? How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Now Jesus is still speaking about that demon possession and about the casting out of the demon and his point is this, the casting out of this demon was not of the hand of Satan but rather this is a result of the advance of the kingdom of God. And so God's power, Jesus' power is greater than the power of Satan. Satan in this picture is the strong man, the one who is bound. Bound by the hand, bound by the words of Jesus. The Christ, the stronger man, the one who has authority over Satan and his demons. We've seen it, haven't we, in, in the pages of the Gospel, how Jesus casts out demons, how he instructs them to leave, and they leave. He has that power, he has that authority. He has already bound Satan. He's not powered by Satan, he's not filled with Satan's power, he's already bound Satan. The devil. But then Jesus moves the conversation on. He moves the conversation on from speaking about demons and spirits to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the one who, with the Father and the Son, makes up the Godhead. And we have this phrase from Jesus here, a phrase which causes uh, many people quite a lot of difficulty. Verse 31, therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. And this causes people concern, it causes people worry. Maybe it causes you worry. Maybe you're one of those people who have thought, well, am I guilty? Am I guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, of this sin that won't be forgiven? How is it that speaking against the Son of Man, that's Jesus, can be forgiven, but not speaking against the Spirit? Well, let's take that question first. If we understand the speaking against, the blaspheming against the Son of Man, well, I understand that as speaking against or, or, or even not acknowledging, refusing to acknowledge Jesus during his time on earth. Of not listening to his teaching. That was applicable to a certain group of people at a certain time in history. They were the ones who rejected him. And yet it was possible for them to still be forgiven, wasn't it? If you think of the thief on the cross. Or, or the centurion at the foot of the cross. The one who declared certainly this man was innocent after his death. They condemned Jesus, yet were surely still named among the forgiven. So they had spoken against the Son of Man. They had blasphemed the Son of Man, and yet were still forgiven. But speaking against the Holy Spirit, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, 
Well, that means refusing to listen to the words of the apostles, to Jesus' closest followers who spoke uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit after Pentecost. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the sin that will not be forgiven, can only be unbelief. Can only be unbelief. The refusal of the work of the Holy Spirit, the refusal of the work of the conviction of sin, the refusal of the work of the revealing of truth from the Word of God, the Scriptures, the, re the refusal of the offer of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is the unforgivable sin. Refusing to believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving work. And how that is revealed in us, to us, by the Holy Spirit. Refusing to acknowledge that work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So are you guilty of that sin? Are you guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? If your hope and your trust are in Christ, then no, you're not. If your hope of salvation is in Christ and in Christ alone, then you're not guilty of that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But if you are hearing this word today, if you are hearing the gospel, if you are hearing of the offer of salvation through Christ and through Christ alone by trusting and believing in him, and if you are hearing that and refusing it, and you continue to do so, then, then yes, you will be guilty of that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit as you continually refuse to accept that work of conviction in your heart. So let me urge you, turn to Christ. Turn to Christ while you can. Believe in him. Think of that man, the thief on the cross. Think of that centurion who, who saw the Lord Jesus, the way he died, the way he responded and put their hope in him. Think of these people who saw the Lord Jesus heal the blind and mute, demon-possessed man and say, can this be the son of David? Yes, he is. And in him and in him alone you find rest and hope and joy and salvation. Trust in him. Trust in him. Let's move on. Verse 33. Uh, we've seen Jesus speaking of two kingdoms, but just as he speaks of two kingdoms, he also speaks of two trees. Uh, one tree that bears good fruit and another that bears bad fruit. And this is simply a picture. A picture of the human condition. A picture, of you, if you like, of the two kingdoms. Now Jesus isn't speaking of those who are naturally good and those who are naturally bad. The only thing, no, the only, the only person who is good is God himself. And so the only thing that can make a person good is trusting in God, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way of entering his kingdom. That is the only way of having a heart transformed so that from it comes good. You see what Jesus says in verse 34? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We could think of the words of God through Ezekiel the prophet when he says, um, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. See, it's belief and trust in the Lord Jesus that brings about this change, this, this new heart. It doesn't come from us, but from God. And so then the good tree will bear good fruit. And so as we live, trusting in Christ, that fruit should be seen in our lives. But Jesus' point here to the Pharisees is that their hearts were bad, and so their fruit was bad. They were wanting to people, people to think. Indeed, they were thinking themselves that they were living for God, that they were serving God, but they weren't. They weren't. See how they respond to the Lord Jesus, to the King, to God's King. How do they respond to him? They reject him. They oppose him. And so as they oppose God's King... So they're really working for Satan. They're on the side of Satan in this battle. Back in verse 30, we have these powerful words from the Lord Jesus. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. 
And this is the thing. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. There is no part good tree, part bad tree. There is no fence to sit on. You know, we have that expression, don't we? Sitting on the fence, not wanting to be on one side or the other. Either you're with Christ or you're against him. Either you follow God or you oppose him. You cannot be in the middle. There is no no man's land in this battle. There is no no man's land in the spiritual battle. So which side are you on? The side of Christ or the side of Satan? We continue. Our next heading, as I said, there's nothing clever about the headings today. Uh, the next heading, verses 38 to 45, an evil generation. We see this description of the people of Jesus' day, an evil generation. We see that in that section, verses 38 to 45. And we continue, really, the theme, the idea of the two kingdoms. It would seem here that the scribes and the Pharisees uh, are, are really representing the people in general. They're seen as evil, and, and so the people are seen as evil. But what is it that prompts this description from, from Jesus? Well, we see the scribes and the Pharisees coming to Jesus and asking him for a sign. Now, this might sound reasonable to us as we read it. They sound like they're being polite. They sound like they're being respectful. You know, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But surely it's just another way that they're trying to show Jesus up in front of the people. They're trying to, to catch Jesus out. It's not just another miracle that they're asking for. It's not just another miracle they're asking for. Remember, just in the last couple of sections that we've looked at, we've seen Jesus healing the man with the withered hand. And the Pharisees rejected him for that. We've seen this deaf, mute, demon-possessed man being healed. A miracle that the Pharisees claim was only possible because Jesus was working because of the power of Satan at work. No, it's not just another miracle that they're asking for, but more like a sign, a, a confirmation of who Jesus is, um, a sign from heaven of, of authentication, if you like, from God. We could think maybe of, of Gideon's fleece, of how when God came to Gideon and said, that, that, and he kind of anointed Gideon to be the leader of his people, and he said, go, because I will be with you. And Gideon questioned how... How will I know this is for sure? And he put a, a fleece out. And he said, if, if the fleece is wet, but the ground around it is dry, then I'll know it's from you. Or we could think of, of King Hezekiah, who, who asked for a sign that the shadow on the staircase would go backwards rather than forwards. That was the kind of sign that these people were looking for. That was the kind of sign that was being asked for here. A confirmation of who Jesus was. An authentication from God of his ministry. But Jesus condemns them for it, saying, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Now, adultery is a theme that we're familiar with from the pages of Scripture. Uh, the way that God's people kept turning away from him seeking instead other gods, following idols, is often described as adultery. Um, think, for example, of the whole book of Hosea, where Hosea the prophet marries an adulterous woman as a picture of how God's people are towards him. And here Jesus speaks to the Pharisees, to the ones asking for the sign, and really says to them, what you've seen should be enough. Only a, an adulterous generation would seek for a sign in the way that you are. Only an evil and adulterous generation. And Jesus goes on, there's no sign that you're going to be given, only the sign of the prophet Jonah. That's what Jesus says there in verse 39. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So what is this sign of Jonah? What, what does Jesus mean? 
Well, he goes on in verse 40 to explain, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish, you know, Jonah the prophet on his way to Nineveh, well, actually running away from Nineveh to the, from the place that God had sent him to, and was caught in that storm and was thrown overboard from the ship and swallowed by the great fish that God sent. Just as he sent the storm, he sent the great fish. <clears throat> and Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, and Jonah repented. And Jonah turned back to God. But just as Jonah was there for three days, so Jesus would be in the tomb, in the grave, for three days. Now, some people might query this, saying, well, Jesus wasn't in the tomb for three days and three nights, as implied here. Um, but according to Don Carson, this can be easily explained. Um, Don Carson says, according to Jewish tradition, three days and three nights need mean no more than three days, or the combination of any part of three separate days. So there's no argument to be had here. But that is the, that is the picture, that is the, the one sign that the people would be given to authenticate who Jesus was. Not, not his preaching, not his miracles, but his death and his resurrection from the grave. His death and his resurrection on the third day. That was the authentication, that was the proof. The only proof that they needed, that he, in accordance with the scriptures, would die at the hands of men and rise again in glory. And as Jesus goes on and talks, then we have a similar picture to the one that we've seen in recent weeks. Remember how Jesus said that if the works he was doing had been done in Tyre or Sidon, in, in Gentile cities, or, or in Sodom, evil place. If he had been doing, if he had done these mighty works, these miracles in those places, they would have repented and turned to God. And here Jesus continues the uh, the story of Jonah, if you like, and, and says that the people of Nineveh, those who Jonah did go and preach to, the, those who Jonah went and preached judgment to, and, and they repented, they turned to God. And Jesus says that the men of Nineveh, they will rise up and condemn the people of his day. Because they would not repent. And because they were so set against Jesus. They wouldn't listen to his preaching. Yet he was greater than Jonah. Similarly too Jesus says that he is greater than Solomon. See that in verse 42. The queen of the south, the, the queen of Sheba, came to see Solomon from across, across the lands. She came from miles to see Solomon and his wealth and his wisdom, and she was amazed. These people, these Pharisees, hearing the very word of God from the mouth of the very Son of God, they heard the wisdom of God from the Lord Jesus. They saw spiritual wealth in, in the Lord Jesus, yet they refused to listen. And so they receive condemnation from Jesus and will face condemnation on the day of judgment if they will not turn and will not repent. The men of Nineveh will rise up and condemn them. The Queen of the South will rise up at judgment and condemn them. Jesus condemns them. And then Jesus continues and we have this little section about the, the unclean spirit, the return of an unclean spirit. Jesus, as we've already seen, has authority to cast out demons, to cast out unclean spirits, and he has authority over Satan, the authority to bind him, being that, that stronger man. And the warning here continues our theme this morning of a warning against trying to be neutral in the spiritual battle. Jesus warns about the possibility of an evil spirit returning even after it's been cast out. This isn't the equivalent of, say, replacing an addictive habit with, with something else. It's not the equivalent of replacing an addictive tendency with something else, important and helpful though that can be. This is a warning against seeking to remain neutral in the battle, entertaining advances from Jesus, from Satan, while trying to keep Jesus on side as well. And the Jesus teaching is this, there are two sides. There are two sides, and you need to decide which side you are on. 
trying to remain neutral, trying to remain neutral, finding the house empty, swept and put in order, will see you overwhelmed by Satan. As the person described in this passage is overwhelmed by seven evil spirits, making their situation worse than it was before, so is the situation of the one who tries to remain neutral. Picture the person who hears the gospel, the offer of salvation through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe they like what they hear. They decide to hear again, go back to church, listen some more, but ultimately do nothing about it. Maybe they like their current lifestyle too much. Maybe they like their current friends too much. Maybe they don't want to lose those things. But they also want to keep hearing the word of God. Maybe you might know people who have gone to church, listened to the word of God, heard the word of God, yet continue to live in a way that's abhorrent to the word of God, to, to the God of the word. Or, or maybe you know people who, on the surface, are good people. They're kind people. They give to charity. They help the poor. They're, they're a pillar of society yet pay no attention to God or to the church or to the Bible. They're simply seeking to remain neutral when it comes to faith and religion. Well, the warning from Jesus here is that they will be overwhelmed, if not in life, then certainly in death, overwhelmed by judgment, the judgment of God. There is no neutral. You are either for Jesus or against him. You're either on Jesus' side or you're against him. And Jesus warns his hearers, gives them that picture of the empty house filled with seven, eight evil spirits. So it will be with this evil generation, he says. If you carry on trying to be neutral, you will be overwhelmed, overwhelmed by Satan. So let me warn you again, there is no neutral in life. There is no neutral. We come again to our last little section. <clears throat> um, mother and brothers. Mother and, and brothers. We see um, this theme again, just as we come into this last little section, and this is what we'll close with, verses 46 to 50. Even while Jesus was there speaking to the people, his mother and his brothers came and politely, respectfully waited outside wanting to speak with him. We don't know why, we don't know what they came to say to him. Uh, maybe uh, as in other places in the scriptures where we read that they came to take him home saying he's out of his mind. You know, they came and, and as we might think of it in, in the church, so they came to speak, they spoke to the steward at the door and said we want to see Jesus, please can you bring Jesus out to speak to us. And it seems that Jesus' family didn't understand his mission. They didn't understand what his role was. Even Mary, his mother, at this stage, seems not to have understood. Nor did his brothers. Uh, after all, we read, um, for example, in John chapter 7, we read, um, For not even his brothers believed in him. <clears throat> but here the point. Even as Jesus uh, says, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? He's not... The point isn't that he's rejecting his family, but, but rather he's using this as an opportunity to highlight the relationship that comes about when a person trusts in him, when a person repents and turns to God, when they trust in the Lord Jesus. Now, it, it might sound harsh to us. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? But he's not rejecting them. Rather, he's highlighting the high position that those who are following him have. And so holding his hand out, he points to his disciples and he says, look, here are my mother and my brothers, those who are following him, those who are trusting in him. They were his true family. And so even in this, we have a repeat of the message that we had a couple of weeks ago. Come to me, you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, it's whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Follow Christ and you come into his family. His true family, his eternal family forever. Trust in the Lord Jesus. Do the will of your Father in heaven. And you become Jesus' brother, sister. 
become part of his true family. But if you don't, if you don't, then you will always be on the outside. If you don't, you will always be on the wrong side. Remember, there is no neutral. There is no middle ground with Jesus. You are either for him or you are against him. You are either gathered to him or you are scattered from him. There are two kingdoms, two trees, two sides. Which are you on? Which side are you on today? Are you for Jesus or are you against him? Those are the only options. There is no middle ground. There is no neutral. Where do you stand today? Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this sobering, challenging message from your word. We pray, Lord, for any who are hearing this message today who are, are, are trying to be neutral. Lord, draw them to your side, we pray. Draw them to yourself. Draw them into your family. Show them that need for rest, for love, for mercy. And Lord, help us as we go into this new week. Equip us, we pray. Help us to share this message with others too. Lord, help us. Help us, we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us for worship this morning. As ever, if you have any questions about what you've heard, anything that you would like to ask, please do get in touch through our Facebook page. Uh, my email address is on there. Uh, you can drop us a message through Facebook as well. Uh, remember, we're back online this evening as we continue our new series and hopefully trust that I'll see you then.